Hello everybody, welcome to the Catholic Redneck, where I talk about religious and moral and political issues from the perspective of a Catholic who is a, a conservative rural southerner. So today we're going to be talking about, I'm pulling up my notes here, uh, today we're going to be talking about an issue that I think is pretty good for this time of year, it's Ash Wednesday. Um, Ash Wednesday, I haven't been to uh, church yet today, but I'm going to later today. So I haven't gotten my ashes yet. But most of you may have already seen um, Catholics walking around with ashes. This is the day of the year we're most visible. You can spot us out of the crowd, even the not very devout ones, because um, Ash Wednesday, even the a lot of Catholics who don't show up for Sunday Mass, even weekly Sunday Mass, will show up for Ash Wednesday. So today we're going to be talking about, you know, you see all of these Catholics, but most Protestants don't actually know what Catholicism is. They think they know what it is, but they actually just know what their pastor told them. And their pastor just knows what the seminary, you know, the Baptist seminary or whatever denomination. Um, he, you know, whatever denomination of a pastor he is, um, whatever that seminary told him. And lots of the time that seminary only knows what they've been, what they've believed for a long period of time, because, you know, Catholics haven't been around in America in large numbers for all that long, especially not in the South. Um, Catholics have always been a minority. So I'm going to be talking about five things today that a lot of Protestants think about Catholicism that are actually not true. Um, I'm not trying to really defend the church's position on any of these issues, but I, I am going to a little bit. I'm going to provide like a basic defense that, um, but, uh, but I'm mainly going to be refining what the church actually teaches and explaining like what a lot of Protestants think that Catholicism is, is not what it actually is. So the first myth, and I call these myths not lies because a lot of these Protestants actually believe this. They're not just trying to spread false things. They think they're spreading real things about Catholicism, real news, but it's actually not. Um, misconception number one, salvation in the Catholic Church comes from indulgences. Definitely not true. Indulgences have nothing to do with salvation. But this, uh, this argument goes all the way back to the time of Martin Luther. They'd say, you know, the church sells indulgences. I don't need to buy an indulgence, um, you know, for my souls to be for my soul to be saved that just comes through my faith in Christ I don't need to buy an indulgence from some bishop right um it's almost like the TV preachers who are just asking for money right that's not what salvation comes from um and a lot of Protestants will say that the Catholic Church teaches that it does but indulgences have nothing to do with salvation here's what the Catholic Church here's how the Catholic Church defines indulgences where is it? Uh, right here. This is Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1471. Okay, that's what I'm going to be quoting from. Basically, it says, indulgences are, and I quote, a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven. So this isn't forgiving your sins. It's not saving you. It's just removing the temporal guilt of those sins, uh, the temporal punishment of those sins after you've already been saved. What's temporal punishment? If you're already saved, why do you need to have temporal punishment remo removed? This is where we get into purgatory. Temporal punishment is temporary punishment. And the Catholic Church holds the idea that after death, you need to be purified of your sinfulness so that you can enter into communion with God. A lot of people will say, well, I don't need to, you know, especially a lot of Protestants, will say like, I don't need to be purified because I've already been purified through, um, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's failing to understand what we mean when we, mean when we say purification. When we say purification, think about it this way. Do you sin? Mo most Christians would say yes, even though uh, Christ died and re was resurrected for them. They'll st still say yes, they sin. So the next question is, do you think you're going to sin in heaven? Most Protestants will say, no, no, I don't think I'm going to sin in heaven. So there must be some kind of change that occurs in you between earth, where you sin and you're a sinful person, 
in heaven where you stop sinning and you become perfectly united with God. That's what we call purgatory. So indulgences, instead of being about becoming saved, they're about um, becoming more pure while you're on earth and doing things to help uh, kind of make it so that there won't be as much work that needs to be done to make you pure once you enter into purgatory in this uh, purification process. Now, I should also clear up one thing a lot of people say about indulgences that aren't true. And uh, Martin Luther said this, and a lot of other Protestants continue to today, that the church sold indulgences, or at least has sold indulgences at some point in history. This isn't really accurate. So what they're talking about was a specific group of, in, a specific type of indulgences that were based off almsgiving back in the Renaissance period. You'd uh, give a certain amount of money to charity, charitable works, um, soup kitchens, building churches, that kind of thing. And uh, the thing is the church stopped doing those kinds of indulgences based on almsgiving because a lot of rich people started to view it like, oh, this is the admissions ticket, right? This is the price of how of not having to go through purgatory. I just need to pay this much money. When that's not what purgatory is about, right? Purgatory is making you purer. So indulgences are about doing that same purification work on earth. So the church was like, okay, we're not trying to view this as a ticket through purgatory, right? We're trying to view this as making people holier. And it's not making these uh, not making these rich people holier who view these indulgences this way. So they removed the monet the monetary indulgences, made it just about pilgrimages, doing good works, or uh, doing certain prayers. And that's they they limited um, they limited the indulgences to just that. And there were also a lot of priests who would pocket the money, right? And that's obviously not what the church wants happening. So they, uh, that, that was the second reason they stopped it in the at, kind of towards the end of the Renaissance. Misconception number two. While we're talking about purgatory or indulgences, let's talk about purgatory because purgatory is you know pretty important for indulgences. Protestants often represent the Catholic doctrine of purgatory as this place where imp imperfect people go to, a fourth place right besides heaven, earth, and hell, where dead Christians go to who aren't perfect. And they just kind of have to suffer and anguish here for an indefinite amount of time period as punishment for not being perfect. That's not purgatory. The only place where we have permanent suffering or semi, you know, in an indefinite period of just suffering is hell. That's not what purgatory is. Purgatory may not even be a place. I'm going to describe to you how I'm going to quote to you from the catechism what the Catholic Church says about purgatory. All who die in God's grace and friendship are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives the name purgatory to this final justification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. This is um, paragraph 1030 through 1031. So this isn't even described as a uh, punishment. It says right here, this final purification of the elect. So it's a purification process. Like I said, it's the change that needs to happen from you going to be a sinful person on earth to a fully righteous person united with God in heaven. It's what has to occur between here to make that happen. It may be a place. might not be, though. It might, it might be a place literally on the way from earth to heaven, but... It might just be a process. Um, and the image of it being a place with a lot of suffering actually comes from the Bible. So a lot, most Catholics are going to say, yes, it's definitely a place where people suffer. But uh, let, me, let me describe this uh, part in the Bible where they discuss this. It's in 1 Corinthians. Peter talks about this test. Sorry, not Peter. Paul wrote Corinthians. Um, uh, Paul writes about this test that Christians are going to have to go through when they're judged, where they put all their works on the foundation, which is called Jesus Christ, and um, they put all their works on it, and the works are tested with fire. If anyone's work survives, um, well, here, let, let me quote it to you. Let me quote it to you. Um, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. 
If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And I've quoted the second Catholic edition of the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, but you can read that in whatever, you know, whatever version you do. I don't care. Um, it's all, it's all very similar. And it's pretty much the same. So notice here that you have some people whose works survive, who have been judged to say, okay, they, they can go straight to heaven, right? They're going to receive their reward right now. Then you got the people who um, seem to be Christians, right? Because they're being saved, but because their works didn't survive this test, they have to be saved through fire. Because they're not perfect, they have to be saved as through fire. Um, and this has led... This has led to the idea of, okay, there's a lot of suffering that probably goes on in purgatory. Uh, maybe it's the fact that the process of you having to give up your sinfulness and become fully righteous, maybe that involves a lot of sacrifice on your part, maybe, to get there. And we don't know exactly what the suffering is for, but um, there definitely appears like there's going to be suffering in purgatory. But at the same time, it's also going to be a place of great happiness and excitement because if you're there you know you're going to heaven nobody who goes to purgatory goes to hell remember, remember what i said that the catechism says right it's the purification of the elect so the damned there's nobody who's damned in purgatory everyone who's there is going to heaven and if you're that means if you're in purgatory you know you're going to heaven so it's probably besides a place of anguish it's also a place of or i shouldn't say anguish suffering it's also a place of great relief, knowing that and joy and excitement, right, over what you're going, over where you're going, right, heaven. And we don't know, I should also mention how long purgatory is. Some Protestants will describe it as like this place where souls go indefinitely. No, it's, it's a temporary stage. We don't know because um, we don't have any revelation from God, right, not in the Bible, not through any other means that we Catholics believe in. Um, and we don't have any way of knowing how long it takes. Might not even fit into the human definition of time, right? We don't know how long pur purgatory takes. But that's what purgatory actually is. It's a purification that takes you from being a sinful, earthly person uh, to being fully righteous so that you can enter the presence of God. Basically, a person who sins versus a person who does not sin at all. Misconception number three. Catholics worship dead people. This is basically an accusation of polytheism, uh, polytheism right? Uh, you got Catholics worshiping all these different saints. But the thing is, we don't worship saints. We do pray to them. But when we pray to them, we're asking, we're, just, we're using the old-timey definition of the word, ask a favor of, like, if I ask you to give me that book, I'm praying to you to give me the book. Um, we're just asking them to pray for us. Now, this will lead to two responses. First response is, okay, well, if that's the case, why do y'all seem to honor the saints so much? Like, one, one particular saint that they really, that a lot of Protestants don't like how much we honor is Mary, right? We got statues of Mary in our churches. You'll see um, Catholics praying whole rosaries to Mary, right? Just spending 15 minutes almost totally praying to the road, just almost totally praying to Mary, thumbing through those beads, you know. Um, so there's a lot of concern from the Protestant community about this. And my, and I've actually heard one Protestant YouTuber make the claim that Catholics have elevated Mary to an almost divine status. Well, to a Catholic, that's logical nonsense. You can't be almost divine. Because to be divine is to be God, right? To be God is to be infinite and limitless. Well, there's no such... That's like saying being almost infinity. There is no number that's almost infinity. Because no matter how high of a number you get to, there's always an infinite amount of more that it would need, right? It's still infinity units away from being infinity. Because there's no end to infinity. Then, um... So that's how I would respond to that. The Catholic Church does not teach that Mary is almost divine because there's no, that's, you either have to be infinite or not, right? You're either divine or you're not. There's no almost divine. And then um, 
then they'll say there will be Protestants who will recognize this, but they'll still say it, it's too close to idolatry. Y'all aren't trying to elevate the saints to divine levels or almost divine levels, as they put it, but you're getting too close. And one evidence is the fact that we have a Hail Mary prayer. And uh, I'm going to actually recite that prayer right now so y'all understand how it goes. Um, here are the words of the Hail Mary prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. That's how the Hail Mary prayer goes. Um, so the first half of it is all from the Bible. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. That's the angel Gabriel's uh, message to Mary. Right, that's his greeting to her when he first comes to her. Um, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. That's from her cousin when she goes to visit her cousin. And both of those are in the Gospel of Luke. So certainly nothing idolatrous there. Second half. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Well, she's in heaven now. She no longer sins, right? Nobody in heaven sins, so she's a holy person. She's the Mother of God, right? She gave birth to Jesus Christ, who is God. Doesn't mean that she's you know, there will be Protestants saying, well, if she's the mother of God, then she has to be older than God or greater, you know, higher in some way. But that's not, that's not a good argument. God created Mary, right? And then when he chose to become incarnated into humanity, he chose to become incarnated through her. But she, since she's the mother of the man Jesus Christ, well, the man Jesus Christ is also God. So she is the mother of God. So Holy Mary, mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. This last bit is probably, if you ask a Protestant, what is the part you disagree with most? It's probably going to be the pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Because Protestants use the rationale of not liking to uh, pray to intercessors, right? Only praying straight to God. They don't want to pray to any saints or anything. That's how they deny the whole Catholic practice of praying to different saints and asking them to pray to God for us, because that's all we do when we pray to the saints, including Mary. Um, and my response to that is like, why is there a problem with praying to saints and asking them to pray for God? And there are two answers you'll get. First one is, we have no reason to think that the pray saints pray for us. I would say we definitely have reason to think that they do. Here's why. If someone asks you right now to pray for them, you're going to, right? I would think so, unless you don't believe in prayer at all, right? But at that point, you'd probably not be a Christian. So if someone asks you to pray for them, you're going to pray for them. When you get to heaven, when you're much better than you were on earth, you're much kinder, you're much less selfish, so you care much more about other people. You also have no nothing you need to pray for for yourself anymore because you're all set, right? You're in perfect communion with perfect communion with God. Um, you don't have any other needs, so it seems like you would be more concerned with the needs of other people. So it only makes sense that these people who are in heaven are going to pray for us on earth. Um, that makes perfect sense. That It's just a logical reason that we believe that, because good people pray for other people. If they're in heaven, they're good, right? We think they're probably going to pray for us. Then the second issue is, well, I don't need to pray to saints to pray for me. I can just pray to God. Why don't I just pray to God? It seems like if you spend all this time praying to saints, you might actually lose some of your relationship with God by not spending enough time with him. And my response is, maybe that could be, maybe that could happen, but it doesn't happen in Catholicism because Catholics pray more to God than they do to any of the other saints combined, all the saints combined, actually, including Mary. Catholics pray more to God than any of them. We do not put our relationship with God at risk by praying to the saints. Um, because we don't need to pray to the saints, we, but we do, right? Protestants say, like, I don't need to pray to the saints. Well, a Catholic, a Catholic would say, yes, you don't have to. But um, just as you would ask your friend to pray for you, we do ask our friends in heaven who have gone before us, the saints, to pray for us. Misconception number four. Catholics have to believe everything the Pope says. This is probably the most understandable out of all the myths because 
the Pope is definitely the leader of the Catholic Church. Um, he's sometimes described uh, as uh, the shepherd of the church. That's why he carries a cane around, right? Um, so it's definitely understandable why a lot of Protestants think this. And the fact that we do believe that he can be infallible on some issues makes it even more understandable. But I'm going to go ahead and quote the First Vatican Council, which was in 1870, which uh, defined um, what papal infallibility was. It had already been around for a long time, but there were some questions over exactly how it works and all that. We believe it's been around since St. Peter. But in 1870, they were wondering, like, what exactly are the limits of it? What is papal infallibility? So they called together a council, and this is what they came up with. In the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, and in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church he possesses by the divine assistance promised to him in Blessed Peter, the infallibility which the divine Redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith or morals. Let's start Let's take this from the top to understand what they're saying. In the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians. So he only has this when he is working in his office as Pope. Um, not his physical office, but right in his position as the Pope. So not when he's calling his grandma on the phone, right? Not in private conversations he's having with his friends, but only while exercising his office as Pope. So that cuts out some of the things he could say. Secondly, it has to be in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority. So he has to actually be using his apostolic authority. Popes will say things all the time. And apostolic authority, by the way, is this idea, right, that comes from St. Peter, um, that the Pope can be infallible in some situations. The Pope will talk all the time and not invoke his apostolic authority. In fact, invoking apostolic authority, the last time anyone did that was 1950. It only happens about once every century or so. So it's not a common thing. In fact, the last six popes, I believe, might be the last five. I'd have to look it up again. But the last five or six popes have not ever said anything infallible and have not invoked uh, apostolic authority at all. Then um, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church. So it has to be a doctrine. It can't just be, oh, all Catholics need to vote for this candidate in this country. No. He can't, that's not one of the things he can do. He can only define doctrinal issues. And I should mention that doctrine does not change in Catholicism. It can develop sometimes, like they'll come up with a new way to explain a certain doctrine or something. But doctrine does not change. So the Pope only in, can only infallibly define doctrines, not new ideas that he's come up with, but actual doctrines of the church. So not near as extensive power as a lot of Protestants will claim. Um, myth number four, I mean, myth number five, Catholics are not Christians. This one is really offensive to me and to pretty much most Catholics because we believe ourselves to be Christians. In fact, Protestantism only came around in 1517. And before there were Protestants, it's not like there were just Catholics before Protestants. There were also Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, which sounds like the same thing, but is not. Uh, Assyrian Church of the East. There may have been some other groups too. But you had all these different types of Christians and that kind of split off from each other. Originally, they were all in communion, but the Oriental Orthodox left and then the Eastern Orthodox Church left. So you had, uh, you've had these schisms. But all these original historical churches will agree that they're all, we're all Christians here. Right, we just disagree about how Christianity is exercised in certain parts of what Christ revealed. Protestants just showed up, broke off from Catholicism, and then claimed that everyone before them, right, all these groups are suddenly not Christians. To me, that just sounds really arrogant and um, untrue. Because if you look at what the Catholic Church teaches, the Catholic Church believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And by the Son of God, we don't just mean the Son of God in the way that we're all sons of God and daughters of God. We mean actually the Son of God, the second person in the Holy Trinity, and is divine himself. We believe he came down, 
He died for our sins, and he was resurrected on the third day, and that um, we will one day be united with him for all eternity. So we, d we do not teach what Protestants claim we teach. We believe, or some Protestants, most Protestants, I would say, know that, we're ca that Catholics are Christians. But Protestants who claim that Catholics are not Christians are just wrong here. Sola Fide and Sola Scriptura were invented by Protestants in the 1500s, so it's very unfair to say that anyone who doesn't accept them is automatically not Christian, when all the groups before Protestantism said that you could be a Christian without holding true to those ideas, because most of these groups didn't have those ideas themselves. Now, I haven't addressed every um, Protestant myth about Catholicism, because there are so many. Uh, I believe YouTube has a 12-hour time limit for videos. It would take up all 12 hours. There are many. Just one I can think of right now is uh, the idea that Catholics earn our salvation. That's not what the church teaches. But to explain it, that would probably, to fully explain Catholic teaching and put it all very well, that would probably take half an hour at least. So, <laughs> too late for this video. But um, my point is there are many other uh, misunderstandings about Catholicism and Protestantism out there. And also, I understand that even if we answered all these myths, certainly just the myths that I've answered, it's not going to convince any Protestants that the Catholic position on these issues is true. That's not what I'm trying to do. That, um, that's not what I'm trying to do. That would be its, its own episode, trying to prove that, that the Catholic position is true. What I am trying to do is point out that what Protestantism says the Catholic position is, is often not what the Catholic position actually is. And I know there are a lot of Protestants out there who do know what the actual Catholic position is, and uh, I appreciate that very much. I'm This video, I'm just trying to explain this to the Protestants that don't actually know what Catholicism teaches. Um, that's all I got. Please comment, like, subscribe. Uh, I'm trying to make this channel grow right now. Um, I'm in the early stages of it. So please like, subscribe, and uh, if, you, if you enjoyed this video and if you thought it was a good video. Uh, other than that, God bless y'all. Y'all have a good day. Um, and I hope to see you again on The Catholic Redneck.